I'm delighted to present this longer and more detailed version of a presentation about aerospace medicine, which was developed by the Aerospace Medical Association. In terms of the overview, we'll run through an introduction, then look at the flight environment, clinical aerospace medicine and operational aerospace medicine. And if we think about how aerospace medicine works compared to traditional medicine, so typically you go to see the doctor if something's wrong. Occasionally you do go for preventive health activities, which are always a good idea, but we are in the normal earth environment most of the time. However, in aerospace medicine, you can be dealing with either normal or abnormal physiology, depending on the individual. And also to some extent, depending on the environment, which can be quite abnormal or unusual. It wasn't really until humans got off the ground that we realized that there could be additional demands on our physiology from going to altitude, for instance, and aviation medicine itself was developed because of the high losses of life in World War I due to physically unfit pilots. This is not, not something that would even enter our contemplation these days that pilots could be unfit for flight. And in addition, the development of manned spaceflight, or spaceflight with humans, led to evolution of aviation medicine into aerospace medicine. Aerospace medicine practitioners have a very wide brief looking after people who work, engage in recreation and travel in the air, sea and space. They're trained in medicine but have a special knowledge of operating in these extreme environments. And as a result, they're uniquely equipped to make decisions on selection and retention of aviators, divers, and space mission and space flight participants. If we have a look at this little graphic in the middle, we have aerospace medicine physicians. And if we go around the rim from the top, we have the military people working in the armed forces across the globe, the FAA and the DOT or Department of Transport in the US. This can be in areas like certification and appeals, aeromedical examiner training and oversight and accident investigation. Space agencies involvement can include astronaut selection and training, clinical and basic science studies, developments of countermeasures and longitudinal health, space medical operations, support for space agencies, and there are many space agencies all around the world. Not all of them have human space flight activities, but the largest ones do. And also the growing area of commercial space ventures. Then moving on to hyperbaric medicine, Practitioners are involved with evaluation and treatment. So things like pathological gas bubble formation, osteo and soft tissue radionecrosis from radiation treatment, treatment of wound infections and thermal burns. And then lastly, airline medical departments. This can cover factors like crew and passenger health, safety policy and regulatory compliance. A very large role for aerospace medicine practitioners is as aviation medical examiners or AMEs. In Australia, they're called DAMEs, Designated Aviation Medical Examiners. And in the USA, they're designated, trained and supervised by the FAA flight surgeons. And in Australia, as I've said, they're called DAMIs and supervised by CASA, the Civil Aviation Authority. 
they're responsible for examining and certifying civilian pilots but to become an aviation medical examiner you have to undergo training to understand aviation related problems physiology standards and administrative processes the u.s has a one-week course with mandatory refresher courses different courses in different places have different durations there are also international aviation medical examiners through the European Aviation Safety Agency. Similar training, but 60 hour basic and 60 hour advanced courses. There are military flight surgeons who care for aviators and their families and manage aerospace medicine and public health programs. And there are special training programs, for instance, the US Residency in Aerospace Medicine, you'll often see this abbreviated as RAM, and non-RAM military courses. Perhaps the pinnacle for many people who get in the area is the idea of working as a NASA flight surgeon, and their duties can include medical care for the astronauts and their families, astronaut selection and mission training, developing physiological countermeasures for space flight, looking after crew health and safety, and research promoting a better understanding of medical issues associated with the space flight environment. If we look at some of the opportunities internationally for advanced training in aerospace medicine, in the USA, there are civilian residencies, for instance, the University of Texas Medical Branch, a fellowship at Mayo Clinic. There are military residencies in all three branches of the forces and also fairly new space medicine fellowships, which are being offered by an increasing number of organisations. In the UK, aerospace medicine is a subspecialty of occupational medicine. There's a diploma and master's degree course at King's College in London, and also a military fellowship at the Royal Air Force Centre of Aviation Medicine. So you might ask, do I have to be a doctor to be involved in aerospace medicine? And happily, the answer is no. There are many different areas in which you can be involved with aerospace medicine. It includes psychologists, physiologists, engineers, environmental health professional, nurses, hygienists, radiation health professionals, etc., etc. So if you're interested, there are always opportunities and ways to get involved. A number of countries do offer training in aerospace medicine, whether this is through the military or civilian components. So it's always worth checking what the situation is in your own country. It does vary very, very widely. Some countries don't have this sort of training, but there are also these days, post pandemic, many, many webinars and online resources that you can access free of charge, even if your own country doesn't offer this kind of training per se. Right, well, let's have a little bit of a look at the flight environment. So starting with the theory of flight and looking at flight within the atmosphere, Bernoulli and Newton described the concept of lift when air flows over a wing, a very basic principle, but super important. And then if we're looking at space flight, there are a number of different aspects. There's suborbital, where you go up and come down again without going into orbit. Orbital, for instance, the International Space Station, Luna. So humans had a number of trips to the moon via the Apollo program and the recent Artemis test flight was successful so the next step will be to send astronauts in around the moon and back again safely and then interplanetary. That's a longer term goal but the first part of that would be the idea of sending humans to Mars.
If we look at our wonderful atmosphere, it does have a standard composition. Nitrogen about 78%, oxygen about 21% and other gases about 1%. There are additional components such as dust and sea salt and that will vary depending where you are. Some places too have a lot more smog and atmospheric pollutants than others. The atmosphere can be described as the gaseous mass surrounding the Earth which is retained by the Earth's gravitational field. So gravity is incredibly important in holding our atmosphere in place and the Earth's magnetic field is also very important in stopping that atmosphere from being blown away by the solar wind. And how the atmosphere behaves in terms of physical principles is governed by the gas laws. The key atmospheric properties that we need to consider when we're going up are temperature, pressure, humidity, oxygen and radiation. If we look at how the atmosphere is classified, there is this thing called the standard atmosphere. The nomenclature does vary slightly depending on where you're coming from, but it's described as being at sea level or 15 degrees Celsius standard pressure of 760 millimetres of mercury or 29.92 inches of mercury or 1013.2 millibars. And there's a little calculation there to show you how pressure can change with altitude. So if we're 760 millimetres of mercury at sea level and we go to just over 5,000 meters, the atmospheric pressure is 380 millimeters. So that's half of the pressure at sea level. And you can see that that very effectively demonstrates the higher up you go, the less and less the pressure is. And of course, there are physiological implications as a result of that. And this is just a more detailed description of how the pressure changes. At 2,400 metres, we have three quarters of the atmospheric pressure, 5,500, roughly half of atmospheric pressure. And then if you're at 10,000 metres, it's only about a quarter of atmospheric pressure. So you can see the higher up you go, the further and further you go, the more you're going to get to the point where there isn't any atmospheric pressure. As a result, there's no air to breathe. The atmosphere is classified into a number of layers and the most important of those are the troposphere, which is where most planes fly. And there is a temperature lapse rate which occurs in the middle of that. It's also the stratosphere which contains the ozone layer which is important for UV radiation protection. The mesosphere which is the coldest part of the atmosphere. The thermosphere which contains charged particles modified by solar flares and the exosphere which is essentially the edge of space, very sparse particles and contains some hydrogen and helium. If we're looking at the different aspects of aerospace physiology, basically just about any body system can be affected. Respiration, cardiovascular, spatial orientation, acoustics, vision, sleep and circadian rhythm, the effects of acceleration, gravity, vibration, hyperbarrier, low pressure, hyperbarrier, high pressure. Could be other physical factors and also human factors, the way that humans interact with the machine or the environment. It's important to be aware of the implication of the gas laws without needing to know the detail.
because pressure changes at different altitudes will create various physiological stresses, for instance, hypoxia and decompression. And one example would be the higher up you go, the expansion of gas within body cavities. So for instance, your gastrointestinal tract, middle ear and teeth. And this is governed by Boyle's law. Respiration can be classified into internal and external. External is a process of ventilation, the exchange of gases between the body and the atmosphere. And internal is chemical reaction at the cellular level between carbohydrates and oxygen, or between fuel and oxygen, producing energy as well as carbon dioxide. It's also important to think about how the process of gas exchange works as part of respiration. Probably the two most important components we need to be aware of are oxygen, which is transported by haemoglobin in the red blood cells, and there's very little in solution in the blood. However, carbon dioxide, in contrast, is transported mainly in solution in the blood and only 5% by haemoglobin. Gas exchange actually occurs at what's called the alveolar capillary membrane, which is the boundary between the little air sac in the lung and the capillary or small blood vessel adjacent to it. And this combines with the haemoglobin in the capillary. So carbon dioxide diffuses from the blood into the alveolus and is exhaled. There are four key causes of hypoxia or not enough oxygen. It's what's called hypoxic hypoxia, which is oxygen deficiency from ineffective gas exchange at the lung or inadequate oxygen inspiration. Hypemic hypoxia, which is oxygen deficiency from reduced oxygen carrying capacity in the blood. Histotoxic hypoxia, which is oxygen deficiency from an inability to use oxygen at the molecular level and stagnant hypoxia, which is oxygen deficiency from inadequate delivery of blood flow. There's one really important thing to keep in mind about hypoxia and that is that altitude is a really crucial factor. The higher up you go, the less time you have to react if you begin to develop hypoxia. So the less time you have to recognize and remedy the situation. The higher you go, the lower the pressure becomes. And also because as you go higher up, the proportions of the gases remain the same, but as the overall pressure is reducing, then the partial pressure of each of those gases is also reducing. And this leads to an increased danger of hypoxia. And by the time that you're getting up to 50,000 feet or 16,666 meters, you only have 9 to 12 seconds of effective performance time before you are overcome by hypoxia. And really important point here, insidious onset makes hypoxia a real danger in high altitude flight. Anytime you have hypobarrier or reduced pressure, you can get decompression sickness. And we've probably all heard about it in relation to diving, scuba diving, but you can also get altitude decompression sickness. And there are a number of different aspects to decompression illness that includes gas embolisms and trapped gas. This is a result of decompression in accordance with another gas law, which is called Henry's law. So the higher up you go, the less the, the pressure. And if you have a decompression event, for instance, a window blows out of the aircraft, then you'll get a significant barometric pressure decrease. 
and the pressure of nitrogen in your blood is then higher than the ambient barometric pressure which can lead to nitrogen coming out of solution and forming bubbles which can result in decompression sickness. There are a number of typical symptoms that people can experience. Limb pain, this is about 90% of all symptoms, most common, typically joint or muscle pain. Skin symptoms, about 13%. Mottling, pins and needles, tingling and prickling. Neurological, between 1 and 8%. And they can be really, really variable symptoms, but if any of these occur, it's always worth thinking about the possibility of decompression sickness. If people have recently been flying or diving and pulmonary or respiratory, about 3%. And these type of symptoms are sometimes called the chokes. The treatment of altitude hyperbaria and decompression sickness includes immediate treatment in the aircraft with 100% oxygen, descending as soon as practical, declaring an emergency and landing at the nearest place where medical assistance is available. And with the repressurization during descent, symptoms may potentially resolve. After landing, hyperbaric oxygen therapy can be useful, so increased relative pressure this can compress the bubbles, increasing the circulation and providing more oxygen to the tissues. It's always important to keep in mind if the person might need specialty care for more serious symptoms such as respiratory or neurological or those that don't resolve during descent or repressurization and potentially think about a neurological consultation. In order to be protected from decompression sickness, it's necessary to have an adequately pressurized cabin. And sometimes people will go through a denitrogenation process by what's called pre-oxygenation, which involves pre-breathing 100% oxygen to essentially get rid of the nitrogen in your blood. This is useful before decompression but it's also useful if it's done below 16,000 feet. Moving on to other factors, we can think about acceleration, inertial forces and the cardiovascular system. At all times, in order to remain conscious, the cardiovascular system has to provide adequate blood flow and there's an equation there, cardiac output equals mean arterial pressure divided by total peripheral resistance. Don't worry too much about that. The most important thing to remember is that accelerative stress will challenge the cardiovascular system's ability to maintain blood flow to all vital systems, especially the brain. And it may also impede venous blood return to the heart. The goal is always adequate end organ perfusion. And if we're thinking about G-forces, you can have both positive and negative G-forces. And G-forces also occur in three dimensions. There's G, X, G, Y, and G, Z. And the little graphic there is a good representation of how that works. If you're involved in a high-performance aircraft, you're typically going to include higher g-forces than if you're in a passenger aircraft and it's possible to get what's called a g-induced loss of consciousness or g-lock which is a state of unconsciousness when the g-forces reduce blood flow to the brain below the critical level and there's also a thing called the push-pull effect which is where you have decreased tolerance to positive g-forces resulting from a preceding relative negative g-force. In terms of human toleration to positive g-forces, if you are undergoing a long duration, which is classified as being over one second, with two g's, you're compressed into the seat, it's a bit hard to move, 
three Gs, your limbs and body feel heavy, it's impossible to move or escape from the aircraft. And if it's more than three Gs, potentially you can have dimming or graying of vision and a possible G lock. It is also possible to train people techniques to withstand G forces, and that's something that military aviators will undergo and also astronauts. If it's just a very short duration, humans can tolerate up to 40 G, but this does depend on the body position. Space flight effects are quite complex, and this is just a snapshot of some of the key things. It affects blood and fluid flow, so there's a fluid shift towards the head and torso. If you're there for any length of time, you can have the effect of bone demineralization with an increased loss of calcium in the urine and a resulting increased risk of kidney stones and also muscle mass reduction. So it's very important for astronauts to exercise at least two hours a day to try to reduce the effects of microgravity on the bone and muscle systems. Space motion sickness, fortunately, that tends to only last for up to a couple of days. Radiation exposure, because of course you're much higher up and much less protected. And decreased immune system function, that can have implications for infections and re-emergence of conditions like herpes and psychology and human factors where you have a small group of people shut up together for a long time, also operating complex equipment. Things can sometimes be a little bit unpredictable, so it's important that people are well selected and well trained. Spatial orientation is a really fascinating one, and this is often a key factor in aviation mishaps. Three components to think of, the, the visual, the vestibular, what's happening in your inner ear, somatosensory, what you feel around you, and the auditory or hearing systems. This can e easily be confused when people are moving in three planes of motion, which is referred to as pitch, yaw, and roll in an aircraft. And disorientation is a leading contributor to many fatal aircraft accidents, sadly. Vision, very important for spatial orientation in flight and being able to see the horizon or seeing landmarks is invaluable. Errors can occur in visual perception, especially if you're in suboptimal climatic conditions and also color vision deficiencies. These can affect up to 8% of men and 2% of women. And there's a note there that identifying these deficiencies is becoming more important as aircraft and air traffic control displays utilize colors and visual cues to display critical information. As you might imagine, noise in aviation can be very detrimental to hearing and communication and the higher the decibels get the more difficult it is to hear what's going on and also to communicate with other people and there's a comparative chart there and if you look at a normal conversation versus the decibels for a jet engine or the Saturn V rocket you can see that there's a huge difference in the sound levels Vibration is also another interesting one, which you might not necessarily think about. It's described as oscillatory motion in dynamic systems, and the human body is most sensitive to vibration in the vertical direction. It can affect a variety of body systems, and this can result in discomfort, pain, and head sensations. And it could also make people really, really tired, which is something to think of, for instance, if you're out in a Coast Guard boat on rough seas, for instance. There are a number of other physical factors to think about in aviation. Temperature is one, 
depending where you are, it could be hot in the cockpit and freezing cold once you get up to altitude radiation that's relevant for air travel at high altitudes. So it's a risk for commercial aviation and space flight crews, toxicology. There's lots of toxins used in aviation, such as fuels. If there's a fire, toxic substances can be released. People drink alcohol, etc., etc. Human factors, really fascinating. And if you look at the definition, it's the impact of human behavior, abilities, limitations, and other characteristics on the design of tools, machines, systems, tasks, jobs, and environments for productive, safe, comfortable, and effective human use. So that's a very long-winded way of saying it's the way that humans interact with their tools and equipment and built environment. And the, the goal of human factor science is to apply the knowledge that's been gained in this area to designing systems that work while taking into account the limits of human performance. Not surprisingly, human error is implicated in 60 to 80 percent of accidents in complex high technology systems and task and information overload is a critical issue and you also see that in aviation mishaps. And just things like colour, size and the position of switches and knobs and their relevance to the mission drive design considerations. Sleep and circadian rhythms Maybe all of you have experienced that your internal body clock shifts with travel and work schedule and can impair your performance. If you haven't had much sleep, it can be the equivalent of being somewhat drunk. This is relevant for both air flight and flight crews in particular, but also astronauts in space. It's really important to plan crew work rest cycles to try to avoid accidents and to teach people that this is something that they really need to be mindful of for themselves. If we're looking at life support systems, there are a number of different types of oxygen systems depending on who you are, if you're a crew or a passenger, depending on the altitudes that you're traveling with and it's always going to be more important to make sure that the pilots and air crew have the highest standard of oxygen system availability because they're the ones who are going to be responsible for getting the aircraft safely down to an altitude where the issue is no longer an emergency but of course it's also important to look after the passengers as far as possible but generally supplemental oxygen for passengers will only be for short-term emergency use and the theory behind this is that it should last long enough that the flight crew can get the aircraft down to a level where the need for oxygen is going to be reduced to a point where supplemental oxygen is not required Air quality is another issue which has become into focus with the COVID-19 pandemic and there are a number of air quality factors to take into account. So the pressure, the amount of oxygen, the amount of carbon dioxide, the temperature, the amount of ozone, the humidity, any bioaerosols like COVID-19 and tobacco used to be a big factor. Fortunately, this should no longer be playing a part in aviation unless somebody decides to do the wrong thing. Humidity is greatly reduced during air flight, so the air is very, very dry, and people will often say that they notice that their mucous membranes are getting dry and irritated. Things like eye drops and nasal sprays can be quite helpful, but our good old homeostatic 
processes within our body to maintain our plasma electrolyte balance at a nice comfortable level. Airplanes do have a very high level of air recirculation and exchange. So this is somewhat reassuring in the context of the pandemic and also have high efficiency particulate air filter filtration processes and carbon dioxide is maintained at the sea level equivalent. It's important to have some sort of medical support and flight crew will be at least first aid trained and occasionally there will be medical personnel on the aircraft who are capable of rendering assistance but this shouldn't be assumed because if you're a radiologist or a dermatologist for instance you might not necessarily have the emergency medicine skills to be able to help in a life-threatening situation. Having a medical system, a medical kit is important to minimise risks as far as possible, to try to avoid unscheduled diversions, but always needing to be aware that the medical capabilities are limited in flight. Communication is really important, so ground support and liaising with experts. People can fly if they require medical oxygen but they usually have to go through an assessment process and need to make special arrangements with the airline. The cockpit emergency oxygen is separate from the passenger emergency oxygen. The passenger supply is normally chemical oxygen generators and there's a limited number of oxygen bottles that the crew can walk around with. If we now move on to clinical aerospace medicine, one of the really important tasks of an aviation medical examiner is to assess pilots and air traffic controllers for fitness for duty and return to flight status. They have a fairly wide brief depending on their, their training and their job position. Could be screening aviators, astronauts, air traffic control personnel for sudden incapacitation or degradation in skills. And this covers a very wide area of medicine and it applies to all types of aviators. It doesn't matter whether you're military or civilian, whether you're commercial or private and also applies to flight crew. There are civilian medical standards and also military standards but these can be different depending on the context on the aircraft mission requirements etc. And two key aspects one is initial selection and then also maintenance of standard. There is a multi-system approach and this is the US terminology here but broadly it includes cardiology, pulmonology or respiratory medicine, ophthalmology, eyes, otolaryngology, so ears and throat, psychiatry and psychology, neurology and other conditions. Starting first with cardiology. It's important to undertake an assessment to mitigate the risk of sudden or subtle incapacitation in aviation and space travel. This can include things like arrhythmias, coronary disease, valve disease, syncope and the use of pacemakers. Pulmonology or respiratory medicine. Factors like trapped gas which can increase the risk of barotrauma with changes in pressure because gas bubbles will get bigger the higher up you go. Lung disease can contribute to hypoxia under reduced pressure conditions so this might increase the need for oxygen in flight and impact on safety and sleep apnea and resulting fatigue can also impact on aviation safety. Vision of course is critical in aviation and you have to think about distant, intermediate and near vision. 
target acquisition. We're not just talking about the military setting and the use of weapons. Also, just things like being able to see the runway or being able to see a landmark. This all impacts on being able to safely operate the aircraft. And if you're flying under visual flight rules, if you're not flying with an instrument rating, then you need to be able to see and be seen. Colour vision, important with instrument displays. So if you're colourblind, that could potentially be a problem and special assessments need to be undertaken in the case of people who are colourblind. Depth perception and stereo vision, really important for terrain avoidance, i.e. to avoid crashing into the ground and for landing and maintaining visual acuity. This can be done through the use of glasses or contact lenses if people don't have perfect vision or surgery might be suitable in some circumstances. With otolaryngology, hearing and hearing protection, really important, especially if there's a lot of noise in the ambient aviation environment or space environment. What's happening with the vestibular system, with what's going on with the inner ear and potential barotrauma from trapped gas in sinus and ear cavities. We probably all had the uncomfortable experience when we're landing of having to pop our ears so that uh, they stop hurting. Psychology and psychiatry is obviously critical because we don't want people who are mentally unwell in any way flying planes or being involved in spaceflight and sadly there, there have been some deliberate air crashes where the pilot has been mentally unstable and crashed the aircraft as a result. So people do need to be assessed for the absence of significant psychiatric disease and psychological and psychiatric factors are really important for long-term isolation and in small groups for long duration spaceflight whether this is exploration or orbital commercial aircraft having a locked cockpit door can be good for stopping terrorists but it can also be problematic if you do have an unstable pilot because nobody can get in to stop the plane from crashing and really important for commercial space flight and space flight participants because you need to know that people aren't going to react badly when they get into that weightless environment and there have been a number of interesting studies using centrifuge to see how ordinary people might react to commercial space flight and some people have reacted adversely in a psychological sense to just being spun around in a centrifuge. So screening people in advance makes a great deal of sense. Thinking about neurology, you do need to check that people are fit to fly and important to focus on conditions which could potentially lead to sudden or subtle incapacitation that can include as far as you can screen for these things seizures TIA and strokes traumatic brain injury and explain loss of consciousness intracranial masses tumors and cancers the effects of HIV and AIDS sleep disorders and also taking any disqualifying medications which might make you drowsy for instance always going to be other medical and surgical conditions and probably the best way to look at this is ones which might potentially impact on flight safety, influence crew performance in flight, influence behaviour or cognitive processing, or lead to sudden or subtle incapacitation. And really important that aerospace practitioners do continuously review changing medical practices, procedures and medications for use in the flight and space environment. So that idea of continuing medical education is really, really important.
So do we just set and forget and just review our air crew at set intervals? Ideally, no. It's important to think about health maintenance and this concept of well-being, which is always going to be an interaction between physical, psychological and emotional factors. Human body can't be isolated from the mind and vice versa, and you also can't isolate people effectively from what makes them who they are and their family and cultural backgrounds, etc. So important factors, regular crew rest cycles, exercise and diet, avoiding self-induced stressors, for instance, alcohol, nicotine and caffeine, and the importance of maintaining a balance in life and in work family life in particular. Important too, to have longitudinal ongoing health and wellness surveillance to ensure that air crew have long, safe and productive careers and also to keep some vision on emerging occupational risks and exposures or environmental threats. And I guess you could say that COVID-19 could potentially be one of those situations where we had to look at things a little bit differently. Hyperbaric medicine is another area of endeavor which can fall within aerospace medicine, but there is a specific society for this called the Undersea and Hyperbaric Medicine Society, which focuses on this area more deeply. Hyperbaric or increased pressure oxygen therapy can be really useful for conditions that result because of air flight, diving and space operations, but can also be very useful for certain infections, wounds and traumatic injuries. Like many areas of health and medicine, investigations and research are really important to understand the science behind it and the best clinical indications and depending on your location, it is possible to undertake formal training in this area. We have a longer list of indications on the right, but that was probably nicely summarized by the first paragraph on the left. If we finally move into operational aerospace medicine, the purpose of this is to address the challenges of operating aerospace vehicles in a physiologically challenging environment. This applies to both military and civilian settings and aims for management and prevention of medical events during operations. If we begin by considering civilian operations, Commercial air transport flight operations for passengers and cargo can be lengthy and therefore necessitate medical prevention strategies such as deep vein thrombosis prophylaxis in susceptible individuals. This could be as simple as wearing support stockings or may potentially involve medications for some people, circadian rhythm issues, the potential for spread of infectious diseases, COVID-19 being a good example, and consideration of radiation exposure, particularly at higher altitudes. And emerging commercial spaceflight operations also underlie the importance of continued judicious review and assessment for medical standards-based operations. This is an evolving area and there's a lot of discussion going on and I'm sure over the next couple of years we will start to see more and more standards emerge in relation to this. Military crew members can be required to operate at very high altitudes for diverse purposes including reconnaissance combat or routine training operations and the unique stresses of being at extreme altitude require special protective equipment and training. Otherwise, you just simply couldn't do those sort of things. Aeromedical transportation, or what is sometimes referred to as retrieval medicine, involves the transport and in-flight care of patients of different acuity levels. 
So this can range from somebody who's critically unwell to a routine transfer, for instance, somebody in a very isolated area who needs to come to a capital city for medical treatment. The typical issues involved in aviation can impact on ability to deliver care in these settings, including noise, vibration, communication challenges and pressure changes. But if you're operating in a military setting, you can also have to worry about combat activities. And the forms of transport include fixed wing aircraft. It can be little ones or big ones and rotary wing aircraft. Hyperbaric medicine practitioners do also support a wide variety of people, including occupational training and remote diving activities. This can include the oil industry, astronaut diving training for extravehicular activities and underwater search and rescue support. You might not necessarily think about the issues of survival, search and rescue unless something goes wrong. But like any potential disaster situation, you always have to plan for this and have contingencies available, undergo training, etc. First thing to think about is crash worthiness and primary and secondary protection. You probably never really considered aircraft and systems to be a life support system, but they are. And if this is well designed, it can aid in the survivability of a crash. It will very much depend on the circumstances of the crash, but sometimes it can be robust enough to protect people and reduce the loss of life. And having a system for search and rescue is also really important to alert people to where you are and that can include beacons and satellite technology in both civilian and military systems and also the importance of survival training that if people do end up in a fairly inhospitable location that they have some basic ideas on how they can survive in the short term until they are rescued. Accident investigations. I have to say that Air Crash Investigations is one of my favourite TV shows. It's always really, really interesting. I always learn something from it and very informative to see the methodical way in which accident investigation is approached and how people can work together and both investigators, air traffic control, international liaison, the aircraft manufacturers to try to work out what went wrong and to learn the lessons from it and then to disseminate those lessons in the hope that improvements will occur and this particular type of accident won't happen again. Fortunately, there have been significant improvements in accident rate since the 1960s. This is due to improved operational procedures, technological developments and application of lessons learned from accident investigations. As I mentioned, it is a methodical and multidisciplinary evaluation of aspects that may have contributed to an accident and civilian and military investigations use similar resources. This can include flight surgeons or medical personnel, emergency response, hazardous materials specialists, aviation experts, airframe maintenance and engineering experts, air traffic and airfield experts, pathologists and toxicologists, dentists to help identify people, for instance, coroners and law enforcement officers. Accident investigations are always very detailed and if we first look at the accident summary, what type of accident was it, communication with air traffic control, is there a flight data recorder and cockpit voice recorder, witness reports and weather conditions, looking at the pilots, their experience, their age and health history, 
what's known about their recent performance and perhaps liaising with their aviation medical examiner, the actual aircraft, the type and its maintenance information, looking at the scene for physical evidence of what occurred, looking at the debris, looking at the victims, thinking about the mechanism of injury that can include photography and x-rays, toxicology, looking for substances that may have contributed to the mishap and forensic dentistry and DNA, for instance, if bodies are very badly burnt and this might be the only way of identifying them. And also corroborating with archival accident data to see if there have been similar instances or near misses in the past that could shed some light on what's happened here. As I mentioned at the start, this presentation was developed by the Aerospace Medical Association and acknowledgement and thanks are due to all the individuals named here who have contributed to the development of this presentation. And I certainly thoroughly recommend the Aerospace Medical Association as a wonderful interdisciplinary, friendly and welcoming international organization which is well worth belonging to it has an annual annual scientific meeting held in the usa which covers both aviation and space it has a number of affiliate and constituent organizations for instance for aerospace physiology human factors space medicine space surgery flight nurses flight surgeons and many more and it also has a special organisation for students and residents called AMSRO. And there's a peer-reviewed journal called Aerospace Medicine and Human Performance. So thoroughly worth being involved with. And there are also many excellent resources on the website. Thank you very much for listening.